Hi there. In this lecture, we see one of the greatest games of chess ever played. And it relates to our knight c3. We can get the same position as this iconic game I'm about to show you. If black plays knight f6 and we play e4, d6, d4, g6, we have an interesting start position. So we're going to use the Kasparov recipe from this start position. So let's look at the game Gary Kasparov versus Veselin Topolov in 1999, the Hugovans Tournament Group A Round 4. So that kicked off with e4, d6, d4, knight f6, and now knight c3. So this is the magic ingredient, knight c3, not committing this knight. This means actually that there's still an option of f3, for example. We have g6, and now bishop e3. Bishop g7, there is a temptation here, perhaps, to play knight g4, but white can play bishop f4, and this position of the bishop g7, queen d2, black castling, f3, knight f6, this would be great for white, and the king's location fixed, the king's side pawns could be used for a hack attack. If instead e5 we just play d takes, on knight takes we get a fine looking position after bishop g3, so bishop g7, f4, knight c6, queen d2, white has a big advantage here, this looks awkward. Okay, so we have bishop g7, queen d2, c6. Again, you might ask knight g4 here. It's a nuisance value, but bishop g5, then we can kick that knight. What black can do, which is sort of interesting, is f6, but the bishop can go to h4. This position, f4, it still leads white to a nice advantage. For example, this situation is going to be pleasant enough after knight d5. Knight takes c7 check, you know, winning material. So, okay, we have c6, and now finally f3, ruling out this knight g4 business. b5, knight ge2. We have knight bd7. And now bishop h6 immediately. Bishop takes, queen takes. So, actually stopping black castling. We have on the king's side, so bishop b7, a3. Queen g7 is fairly pointless just rook g8 and then in fact g5 is useful black might even have a small edge here so that's completely pointless queen g7 so a3 trying to dissuade b4 e5 white castles queen side queen e7 king b1 now this makes way for a nice maneuver actually to try and target a potential defensive piece if this can be knocked out later if black's castle then queen side then we can make use of maybe potentially the lion squares a little bit more. A6 is played. We have knight c1. Black castles queenside. Knight b3. E takes d4. Rook takes d4. C5 was played now. So the rook steps back. Knight b6. And now a little bit of a controversial move. And you can only really say this because there's an amazing resource later which actually casts doubt, a little bit of doubt on white's play. The move is g3. It seems as though there might be a more accurate move here than g3, which is queen f4. And this basically sets up the idea of knight takes c5 if king b8. So as example, if knight h5, the queen can go to e3. This position, there's g4, and now h4. And this should be interesting for white. You can see that d5 is disabled. The queen's putting pressure here on c5 in any case. So that's a small edge for white. The other aspect to consider here is king b8, knight takes c5. And you might ask, what, what about knight h5? Interestingly here, there's a resource which should make it absolutely clear it's better for white, which is, can you spot it? Yeah, there's knight takes a6 check, bishop takes, queen e3. White is getting several pawns now by hitting the knight. b5 is, is, is going to be taken. So this position is going to be an advantage for white. So that's fascinating stuff. If rook hg8 here, g3 now, and this, you know there's a big difference in position with the queen on f4. So here, queen e5, queen c1 is a key move, and this should, in a theoretical sense, be an advantage for white. Whatever black hat, you know plays, it looks as though it's going to be an advantage. This position is too dangerous for black to take on e4. There's a bishop g2, f5. We can take here and then play rook e1. And this just ends up being 
a big advantage for white this possession so for example here rook takes e4 is possible queen e3 so yes white ends up you know being much better so it seems that's a very interesting key move and move 17 in a theoretical sense but g3 has venomous value in practice we have the move king b8 so this kind of enables black to potentially look forward to d5 and we have knight a5 which releases the pressure off c5 so it's actually in a way making d5 even more possible we have bishop h3 now so now yes yeah, some escape squares have been taken around the king so that's a danger sign if g4 was played this is now just even d5 without penalty without too much penalty black should be fine here this kind of sacrifice is useful if white wants a draw by perpetual check so for example here there's a draw by perpetual check but anyway bishop h3 was played d5 queen f4 check king a7 rook he1 d4 and now knight d5 and in a way this does look a little bit suspect that white is getting a dislocated pawn here after knight b takes d5 e takes we have queen d6 and you might ask well surely surely this pawn is is like it's disconnected from the network of pawns we have bishop on it we have a knight on it we have a you know rook on it we have so many things on d5 that uh you know it's it looks as though you know this this should be dropping off what what is going on here but there's an absolutely brilliant move that Sparford reckoned with which emphasizes some of his control of escape squares here so a major attacking player is leveraging the king escape square some of them being taken out here in spectacular fashion with this next absolutely iconic move which seems to bring white's play together and justifiably together so this is a brilliant move move 24 can you guess it for 200 points or work it out yeah the move played is rook takes d4 and it seems to bypass you know this this weak pawn for king safety basically but actually there, there is a resource here black played in with it getting the most marvelous you know one of the most marvelous king hunts, king king hunts in um chess history black you know took the rook but it turns out here if basically I mean what was white's option if white had played if white doesn't play rook takes d4 if white plays queen takes d6 then it doesn't matter about these uh, attacking pieces around some squares knight c6 check king b6 95 and this pawn will drop off and black will have an advantage and in fact the bishop is even protecting f7 here against knight takes f7 so it's you know basically a forced move like rook takes d4 for any practical chances now black took but there is actually king b6 which is fascinating it leaves a very dangerous position for white perhaps white's better move best move is b4 and queen takes rook takes knight takes d5 black has a small edge there if knight b3 then we're back to bishop takes d5 and if queen takes yes the steam's taken out of white's attack but maybe Topolov wanted to be part of something really special and to show this king hunt on the board perhaps in some level you know he was looking to be part of an iconic immortal game so he took on d4 perhaps you know this resource hadn't occurred to him this king move this quirky king move you don't often think about king moves as candidate moves generally speaking you want the king safe and not coming up the board because as a general heuristic if your king's coming up the board that's usually a bad sign unless you're tigger and Trojan, uh, beating a spark but with weird king moves but yeah this is topolov so he actually takes on d4 and um, now we have a remarkable you know the concept here is remarkable so what's the follow-up here for 200 points okay it's actually rookie seven check 
So a drag and drop tactic. So <laughs> yeah, if if rook d7 we can just take the queen. It's you know that pin against the rook means we can take the queen. So king b6 was played. If queen takes e7 testing it, the, the point is queen takes d4 check. And you can see that actually the knight, bishop, and queen are conspiring very well. Conspiring very well against the king here. Queen b6 check, bishop b7, knight c6 check. And you can see that the bishop was controlling that escape square. And, it, and this is like a checkmate here. If king b8 instead, then we can just play queen takes d4. And we're actually threatening queen a7 mating. What does black do? So if queen takes e7, that releases control of b6. So we can just pounce into that weakness of the last move. And then knight c6 check, and then queen a7 is checkmate. So that's diabolical. Rook d7, we're just going to take on d7. We're also looking at h8 here. You know, we've got other options as well. If knight takes, we can take on h8 as an option. If queen takes e7, we're just playing queen b6 check and queen takes b7 checkmate. So that's quite vicious, basically, if king be, if the king steps back. It's bad news in a nutshell because of queen takes d4. So the king steps forward, but this is the wrong time for king b6. We have queen takes d4 check because the king's having to step forward again with king takes a, a5. If queen c5, the problem is there's a weakness of the last move here, which we can tap into. You know, the queen takes f6 check. And the remarkable thing about this position, there's actually a really crushing resource behind the scenes in this variation. Can you see what that is for 200 points? It would actually be bishop e6. So if f takes, we're just taking on e6. What does black do? If king takes a5, we play b4 check. And here, queen c3 threatens queen b3 checkmating. So this is just all over. We're again renewing the threat of queen b3 checkmating. So here, you know, this is just checkmating. So that's all pretty vicious stuff actually there. So on queen c5, yes, this is an amazing resource, bishop e6, which in earlier analysis of this game, I'm not sure, you know, was mentioned basically in too many places. It's amazing uh, resources to be discovered basically in this game and with that rook on the seventh you can also imagine that it's a bad idea this because of b4 check and queen d4 here and the rook is taking out escape squares of the king there so that's horrible so okay so the king comes up the board we have b4 check king a4 and now queen c3 so the mate threat is now queen b3 checkmate so queen takes d5 parrying that and the problem for white here is if king b2 then black plays queen d4 winning as well because it's pinning the queen that's that's more than enough that's actually winning for black so Gasparov is forced into another he finds the only like only move basically can you see what that is in the light of queen d4 as a resource we can't play king b2 for queen b3 he plays rook a7 and this puts black under enormous pressure introducing another mate threat so we have bishop b7. If rook d6, king b2, queen d4, this doesn't work here because we just take actually on d4. Rook takes d4, rook takes a6 is sufficient for checkmating. So bishop b7, we have rook takes b7. Queen c4 now. If queen takes b7, queen b3 is checkmate. If queen d4, queen b3 is checkmate. So queen c4, keeping control of b3 is essential, basically. But queen takes f6 now. We have now king takes a3, and all of a sudden black has a threat or two, like rook d1. <laughs> For example, the king is helping take away the, the white king escape squares. But now things get amazing. Queen takes a6 check, king takes b4. There's an absolutely amazing resource here that Xparov uses which proves the concepts. This is absolutely marvellous. Can you see what white plays here for 200 points? Okay, it's c3 check. It actually creates another checking angle if the king takes. 
But if the queen takes, queen takes b5 check, king a3, rook a7 check is mating. So king takes c3, but we have this other checking angle. Only move for advantage, king d2. If king d3, we play bishop f1 check, and then black does have a resource rook d1. So we first play queen e5 check, and then we take the queen with advantage, big advantage. So king d2 was played though, avoiding that uh, bishop f1 and queen e5. And now queen b2 check, king d1. Another, another, another remarkable move. Absolutely amazing game, really. One of the greatest games ever. Can you spot what it is for 200 points? Yep. Bishop f1. Bishop f1 is played. So here, if queen takes f1, queen c2 check, king e1, rook e7 check, queen e2, queen takes e2 is mating. So yes, crushing. If rook, so rook d2 was played, but now <laughs> yet another remarkable move. It's, it's so many remarkable moves in this game. Can you spot what it is for 200 points? Five seconds, pause the video here. Rook d7, yes, pinning that rook, threatening queen takes d2, checkmate. We have rook takes d7. So if queen takes f1, we're playing queen takes d2, check. queen takes d2, checkmate. So basically, rook takes d7, but now bishop takes c4. And the thing is, the queen is eyeing h8. That's a punchline. So queen takes h8, rook d3, queen a8, c3. And now queen a4 check, stopping any dangers really, squashing them. f4, f5, king c1. So d1 is now controlled. Rook d2, and now queen a7, and the game ended here at move 44. What an iconic game. If king e2, just queen takes h7, for example, here, and white could even just simplify it if needed into, you know, winning king and pawn ending, this this would be absolutely winning, but lots of roads to, uh, to victory there. So, okay, so the game ends on, game end is on queen a7. So an absolutely remarkable, iconic game. And for me, this is an absolute model game. Whatever move order, if you have this position, basically this is an interesting model game from this position to consider basically bishop e3. We're essentially playing as if we're playing against a Sicilian dragon with f3 and queen d2. This is like a, a standard structure to try and challenge the Fianchetto bishop. So absolutely iconic game. I hope you're inspired by this game. And the uh, tactics are absolutely astounding, of course. We can learn a lot tactically from that king hunt, dragging the king down the board. Okay, thanks so much.